much. So, uh, I'm Mark Campanale from the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Uh, what I'd like to do is imagine that you are, you're an asset owner, you're, you're a fund manager, an investment analyst, and you've got Blockbuster, Olivetti, and Kodak in your portfolio. And uh, you're rather concerned that something's happening to Blockbuster. Uh, you're rather concerned that maybe Kodak has had its moment, and you're trying to work out to do what to do. So what this session is really about is to try and to think forward a few years and what is going to happen to particularly the fossil fuel companies in, in transition. How can we create workable models as fund managers and analysts that can work out actually uh, at what point do these fossil fuel companies um, switch or change? Are they going to become clean energy companies? Are they going to be running themselves off, closing themselves down? Um, how do we go about thinking this through and doing some maths? And, and, and sitting on me today is, we've got a fantastic panel. I'm just going to say just one or two words about each of them. Helena Morrissey is the Chief Executive of, of Newton Investment Management and also Chair, I believe, of the Investment Management Association. Paul Spedding is Senior, Analy uh, senior uh, Advisor to the Carbon Tracker Initiative and ex-co-global um, head of oil and gas at HSBC. Mark Lewis is the new Head of Energy and Climate at Barclays. Utility. Utilities. Utilities, nearly got it right, Mark, thank you. Um, and Natasha is Head of Sustainability and Responsible Investment at uh, Saracen in London. So the way we're going to open is I'm going to ask each of the speakers to speak for five or six minutes, and then we're going to have a comp see what, what see what we throw up, and then have a conversation around the issues. And I'm going to invite Natasha to present first. Yeah. Um, I think you've got a, a PowerPoint that I hope is going to come up. I Here we do. go. Um, forgive me for this. Uh, but I do have a couple of slides which I hope will help illustrate the, the brief points that I'd like to, to, to make this morning. Um, and, and I hope this isn't too terrifying to start off with, but, but um, before we look forward in terms of valuations and how decarbonisation could, could impact oil and gas company valuations or, or what they're worth, uh, it's worth looking back. And what we've done here is just very simply looked um, at the returns on investor capital, the ROIC, R-O-I-C, and compared that to the weighted average cost of capital, uh, the WAC, um, uh, if you like, uh, to, to, to have a look at what sort of uh, value the five largest oil and gas majors have produced over the last 25 years. And I think um, probably the main takeaway I'd like you to uh, to absorb is, is that really whilst there has been tremendous cyclicality really driven by movements in oil price, over the cycle generally the industry returns its cost of capital and no more. So I think that's quite an important fact to digest. So when oil prices are going up you will have brief periods where they are returning above their cost of capital but quite quickly that's whittled away through uh, supply increases as well as cost increases, and then it comes down again. Um, the second uh, main point that I'd like you to take away from, from these charts is that whilst you have this cyclicality in, in returns, whilst having a pretty constant uh, return over, over the cycle, um, invested capital has grown over the years. And, and that's what that bo bottom chart shows you. So it is a growth industry as well as a cyclical industry. If we now turn to the issue of share price and valuations, effectively this is about discounting back to today's prices future cash flows which will be attributed to shareholders. So we're looking forward. And when you look forward, you need to forecast and you need to think about how uh, these scenarios or situation may change. And I think as we've heard already from the previous panel, uh, we have a sort of set mindset almost with, within the industry, uh, we feel, as well as amongst many sell-side analysts, that there is a sort of business as usual. And that is the first scenario I have here on the table. So this effectively assumes that yes, climate change is happening, but clearly the world is not going to take robust enough action to sufficiently reduce demand. So we're assuming that long-term growth, that invested capital chart that I showed you before, will continue. And unlike history, many within the industry will, will argue that 
the ROIC, the returns, will be above the cost of capital into the future. And on this basis, yes, there is upside, material upside to today's share price, you know, in the realm of maybe 10 to 30 percent, depending on your model. But if we uh, take a step back and, and consider everything that we've heard today and the reality of the situation, and we see that train coming along the track and know that, in fact, change is happening, action is already being taken, and in fact, there is a very real risk of so-called stranded assets, we're into either of the two bottom scenarios. Now, the first one, the middle one, if you like, is assuming that the industry remains in denial, so continues as if it's business as usual, and yet governments are taking actions, robust actions, so the demand for fossil fuels is coming down. And in this situation, there'll be continued investment in developing reserves, et cetera, by the oil and gas industry. But unfortunately, the ROIC, the returns, will be well below the cost of capital, and that is because demand will be coming down, oil prices will be coming down, and they will simply not be able to co cover their costs of capital. In that situation, you will be seeing very serious impairments and so-called stranded assets write downs, so, and that's something we have already seen with today's low oil prices, and that would simply continue. And that, in other words, is a form of shareholder capital destruction. The third potential uh, scenario, which is one that we would like to see evolve, and that this would be um, what Anthony was referring to earlier, a, a result one would hope of very uh, robust engagement from, from investors, is one where the industry actually says, this is serious, this isn't noise, this is a signal, we have to change our behavior, we have to cut back capex, demand is going down. And in that situation, we may well see the companies delivering returns above their cost of capital and returning cash to shareholders. And it's absolutely possible there that share prices could go up. So I guess if I wanted to leave you with one message from this, I am a real believer in engagement. I'm a real believer that the fossil fuel industry has the potential and indeed the due to be part to be part of transitioning us to a low carbon or zero carbon world and that we have the tools available to us as shareholders as investors to help facilitate that change now it will depend very much on the behavior of the companies and the leadership as to how bumpy that journey will be but absolutely these companies can certainly be part of the solution in our mind. Thank you. Well, thank you for, very much for that opening stance, Natasha. Before we move on to Paul, um, that's a good, quick question. What, um, what are clients saying? What are clients asking you to do at Saracen? And what, what are the issues that they're thinking about? And what you've developed um, there in your presentation, is that the house view or is that the, dare I say it, the sustainability investment team's view? Are you talking to me? Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. I thought you were talking to Paul. No, Excuse no, me. Go, go ahead. Is this the house view? Yeah. No, no, this is absolutely the house view. Excuse me. Sorry, Mark. Um, I, I mean, the, if you like, uh, where I sit within the investment team is that I report to the co-head of, of asset management, and we work in a very integrated fashion and these charts, et cetera, have been uh, developed with them. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's good. To, it's good to hear because sometimes we hear this issue, the climate issue, is really tucked away in the corner. Mm. It's not really the mainstream view. And to hear that it's actually a house view to take that approach is quite uh, reassuring. I just wonder how representative it is of uh, UK sort of fund managers on, on um, as a whole on, the, on their approach mm. to the mm. fossil fuel sector. But maybe before we, we won't answer that question mm. right now, but maybe we can pick up in discussion. But you've laid out some um, interesting points, and maybe now I'd like to, to turn to Paul to pick up the thread, and let's hear from you and your views. Uh, thanks very much. I suppose the first thing I should do is apologize for not wearing a tie, um, <laughs> but I'm desperately trying to forget I was an ex-investment banker, and so I don't own any anymore. Um, <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about valuations to start with, um, as to, to how the sell side is, is looking at the world. 
Um, now, in theory, the valuation of any equity is going to be the value of its future dividend stream. And assuming you believe the sell side, which I'm not sure I would, if you opened any sell side model for an oil company, what you would probably find is rising production profile, rising oil price, and rising capex. That is clearly not consistent with an energy transition. It is business as usual. Um, I suppose the next question to ask is, well, what should we be doing if we want to value oil companies under an energy transition? Um, sort of start from the same perspective, really, which is that if I'm building my model, I need to have a volume scenario and I need to have price scenarios. And I, I stress the word scenario. I think part of the problem with the sell side today is that it's still very much a single variable valuation approach. They may give you some degree of sensitivity, but they will still feel that there's only one answer, and that is unfortunately a business as usual answer. Volume, I find, is the easiest thing to, to get a scenario for. You just go straight to the IEA and look at the scenarios they have. Um, and in theory, if you're looking at a company that's growing at 1% a year, which is business as usual, compared to one that's growing at, or falling at 1% a year, which is close to 450, you would find a change in valuation of around 15%. Um, having said that, clearly the company that has decided to shrink, if it manages that shrinkage, uh, would obviously free up a lot of cash flow, it'll turn capex effectively into dividends. And if I go off at a little bit of a tangent, apologies, talking about the cost of capital. Cost of capital in theory has risk as a major part of the calculation. I would argue that a company that is trying to grow at 1% under business as usual has much higher risk than one that is shrinking at 1%, effectively managing the client, going into harvest mode, I call it, very much what the tobacco companies have done in the past. So I would say that although I've talked about a 15% fall in value from the volume effect, if a company chooses to give that capital back to shareholders and if, if by going into a decline mode, it, I would argue it has lower risk and therefore should have a lower cost of capital. So you could end up with a scenario that a, a no growth company could be worth more than a high growth company. But I'll, I'll just leave that at the moment and then move on to price. Unfortunately, price is the hardest thing to do. There is no direct linkage between a demand scenario and a price scenario. You only have to look at the history of the oil price over the past five years to see that. Um, what I would say, though, is that when you have weak demand, you tend to have price pressure. It doesn't mean you're going to have low prices, but there will almost always be downward pressure on prices. If you ask any oil analyst if he can forecast oil prices, if he tells you he can, he's lying. You We've been very, very poor at forecasting oil prices. But what, what I can do is go through a scenario, series of scenarios and say, well, let's look at these companies on different um, planning assumptions. That is very rarely done, um, and I think it is something that will need to be done more and more. Um, what I can say is that there have been several organizations, including the IEA, who have had a go at looking at what price scenarios would look like under current policies, new policies, and 450. Um, Carbon Tracker has done something similar. We've, we've all come to roughly the same uh, conclusion, admittedly many, many years apart. The IEA study back in, the, in 2012 came to the conclusion that you should have a plus or minus 25% band around uh, new policies. The carbon tracker work, which looked at um, the difference between, uh, back I think it was 2013, looked at the difference between um, effectively a 450 and a low demand scenario, came out with something like plus or minus 20. Uh, even oil companies have something similar. Shell, uh, obviously one of the best forecasters of oil prices, not, um, has plus or minus 20 as well. So what, what I'm interested in is, well, what does a $20 move in the oil price do to your valuations? Um, well, if I take the Shell central planning assumption of $90, nearly double the current oil price, um, then that would reduce the asset value of their assets. And this, is, this is very theoretical, very back of the envelope, by roughly 30%. You might say, well, $90 is far too high an oil price, um, and I'd probably agree with you at the moment. If I drop down to 70 and look, like, look at the move from 70 to 50, we're up to nearly 50% change in valuations. So what you can see there is that something that many mainstream sell-side analysts would regard as a very low-risk scenario actually has a very high-value impact. And I think that's something that needs to change on the sell-side. And, and, and I think it is the buy side that can, can pressure for that. I mean, one of the reasons I did the first piece of work on the cost of carbon 
to the oil industry back in 2008 and then again in 2013 was because um, some institutions rang me up and said, look, have a look at this, please. And my initial reaction is no, because I'm going to stay on business as usual. But then you, I suddenly realized that they were actually interested in what my view on this was, whereas they weren't actually interested in my view about where the oil price was going. So you can see there that the, the, the risk, I think, from an energy transition to the oil sector is quite high. Um, there is, in my view, a way that the oil industry can respond to that, which is to go into harvest mode rather than growth mode, which I think will lower their cost of capital, certainly would lower their risk. Um, I think that the sell side has to grow up and start looking at scenarios like this, but I also think that management needs to grow up and start looking at this as a potential risk, because at the moment you'll get the argument that an energy transition isn't going to happen. What I want to know from management is how are you going to change your business model if you were given an energy transition scenario? How, what would you change? Because at the moment, I don't think I've seen anybody say that. Um, the one question that I haven't answered was how could you run an oil industry or an oil company to cope with the energy transition? But I think I'll leave that for either somebody else or for somebody to ask me from the audience. Well, thank you very much, Paul. So uh, I think to conclude what you were saying is that the market is not pricing in an energy transition and that you still see um, downside risks to companies if they continue business as usual, certainly in the case where oil, doesn't, oil prices doesn't do, do, not, do not recover. Um, so we'll come back to that. Um, now, uh, sitting next to you is, uh, is Mark from, from Barclays. Um, both of you, I know, have had a lot of experience on the sell side as, as analysts. Um, I'm just listening to what Paul's been saying. Um, do you have what are your, your comments and insights? <clears throat> yeah, well, thanks, Mark, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, really, what I wanted to do, actually picking up on what Paul and Natasha have said and hopefully feeding into uh, Helena, um, is to give my view of, of what's happened. We, we talked here, we've heard a lot of talk about the coming decarbonization, the energy transition. I want to talk about a sector that's been through a transition. The transition is, is to a large extent, has already happened in the utility sector, or it's very well advanced. Um, I've been covering that sector on and off 17 years, and I really want to try and give some lessons learned over the last 10 years, what's happened in the utility sector, and, and try and draw out those lessons for, for where we are today. Um, I, I think the first thing you can say is that if, if you uh, looked back 10 years ago, you, you'd struggle to find any sell-side research that was suggesting that the valuations of some of the largest and best-known companies in the sector could fall by between 60, 70, 80 percent over the next 10 years. I think that should be the starting point for any analysis of, of the potential impact of decarbonization. We all talk as if um, decarbonization and stranded asset risk is a, is a hypothetical. It is not. It, it, this is a sector that has already experienced it. So specifically, in, in, in the short time available, I want to try and answer uh, three questions. One, what did we know 10 years ago about the coming decarbonization challenge for the EU utility sector. Secondly, how did companies and analysts react to the emerging decarbonization framework that was already there in Europe? The, the framework was there. And, and how have they adapted along the way? And third, what lessons can we learn from that experience as we now look at the state of play with regard to the emerging global framework for decarbonization as manifested in the INDCs and the potential outcome from Paris? Well, if you cast your mind back 10 years ago, the um, uh, European uh, carbon trading scheme was just getting going in 2005, and policy formulation was well on, on the way to achieving what we finally got in 2007, which was a very coherent what, what subsequently came to be known as the 2020 package, the 20% reduction in uh, carbon emissions, uh, that 20% of all energy consumed should come from renewable sources, and that Europe's energy efficiency should improve by 20% uh, by 2020. Um, what actually happened over the last 10 years versus that framework and how did the companies adapt to it? And I, I can say this as, as someone who was both covering the sector for much of that period. I also spent one year working inside one of the largest uh, European utilities between 2004 and 2005. Uh, so I can perhaps throw some of that experience into this as well. I, I want to make four key points. You know, what did we get right and what did we get wrong? What did we specifically on the sell side? get right and wrong. I think the first point is, very clearly, the impact of renewables has been much more disruptive 
much more disruptive than anybody foresaw at the time. I don't think you could go back 10 years and find a single piece of research. I may be wrong. If anybody's got, brought any along with them, I, I, I sit to be corrected. But I, I think you will really struggle to find uh, any uh, uh, sell-side research from 10 years ago that suggested we would be where we are today on renewables. In fact, if you look at what the German government was saying in 2004, their target was that 20% of electric electricity generation should come from renewables by 2020. Uh, in 2015, first half of 2015, we're running at about 30%. So th th that's, just, that's just an idea. Now, it's been particularly strong in countries like Germany and Spain, uh, but the, the other uh, virtuous circle you get into is when you have very strong policy support, it creates incentives for people to invest and deploy uh, technology more quickly. And, of course, what we saw, which, again, I don't think anybody anticipated, was the Chinese ramping up investment in solar PV manufacturing. So the cost of producing producing solar PV panels absolutely cratered, again, in a way that nobody uh, foresaw. That's the first point. Second point is, the impact of the recession notwithstanding, which has been huge, you know, that impact in 2008, 2009 on energy consumption and electricity consumption has been huge. But to Paul's point, I think the companies themselves and most of the sell side, we were all anticipating that demand would increase into the future and that more and more capacity would be needed uh, going forward. Uh, just a couple of statistics that I think uh, make the case uh, for how badly we got things wrong. UK electricity consumption peaked in 2005. Uh, consumption of UK electricity peaked at 350 terawatt hours in 2005. In 2014, UK electricity consumption was 303 terawatt hours. It's down by 14% in nine years. Absolutely extraordinary. Now, I'm not saying the recession didn't have a role in that. It had a big role. But the point is, uh, it hasn't come back. The last time we saw UK electricity consumption at that level was 1995. We're back to the level we saw in 1995. EU power generation as a whole, which takes into account the faster growing nations in Eastern Europe, um, last year was at, uh, or 2013, 2,980 terawatt hours compared with 3,200 in 2008. So, uh, and, and finally, if you look at total primary energy consumption, I was very surprised when I looked this number up. Total primary energy consumption in Europe in 2013 was 1,666 million tons of oil equivalent. That is exactly the same number as in 1990. 23 years later, exactly the same number. And that's after you take into account the fact that we've absorbed very fast-growing nations of Eastern Europe. So, look, the recession has had a big impact, but energy efficiency measures uh, have been having an impact, and perhaps a bigger one than any of us uh, thought. Third thing, uh, I'm conscious of time, third thing, the carbon price signal has failed on both an absolute and a relative basis. It's failed on an absolute basis because the price collapsed given the uh, fall off in demand and there was a, a design fault in the scheme which the European Commission has been addressing with the introduction of the market stability reserve. I think we will see uh, um, potentially prices coming back over the next five years. But it failed on a relative basis as well. And I, don't, I think this was one of those uh, unforeseeable events where the fall in the, uh, the, fall in the price of carbon uh, at the same time that uh, gas prices in the US fell very sharply while gas prices in Europe remained high because of the link with oil in Europe meant that the US started exporting a lot of cheap coal to Europe and we've ended up with this paradoxical situation where not so much this year but uh, 2011, 12, 13 we saw uh, coal uh, generation increasing again. That was an unforeseen. So, so things don't necessarily turn out the way you expect them to even when you think the policy framework is designed to achieve a given outlook. And, and, and I'd make the fourth point, uh, nuclear policy was a black swan event in Germany. Black swan events happen as well. You know, and by definition, we can't plan for those, but they happen, and energy analysts have to be uh, aware of all that. Um, what does it all mean in terms of uh, uh, the lessons we can learn uh, for today? Um, I think the first relevant lesson is, uh, despite the EU ATS coming into being in 2005, and despite the very clear legally binding framework that we had and that was put in place in 2007, analysts and the companies were slow generally, generally, to react to that changing uh, uh, policy framework. So the power of business as usual is enormous, and I don't think any of us should be under any illusions of that. If we then look at the emerging global framework that all of the uh, UNFCCC work has been, and, and we're now in the run-up to COP21. 
I don't think we should be under any illusions either that if, if it's been difficult to get analysts and companies to adjust to a clear policy framework in one jurisdiction, it, it's, it's, it's a big ask to get analysts to take into account in their valuation models today uh, the outcome of a conference, which although it has a clear two-degree target and a two-degree outcome, does not yet have a roadmap for how to achieve that. So filtering down those INDCs into analyst model um, is a more complicated task than, 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 uh, than people realize. And, and you know, that, that should, the, the, the scale of that task should not be uh, underestimated. But second, the, the advances in renewable technology have been so much greater than anybody expected that technology, who knows, where, who knows how fast energy storage and other emerging technologies will come through in the next 10 years. But I think uh, it's very clear that over the last 10 years, the impact was much greater than expected. And um, that, that is something everybody needs to be thinking about. I think it was very interesting, and I'll conclude here, uh, what the uh, CEO of Enel said uh, last week in an interview that was published in, in the British media where he said, um, essentially, that, that um, the fast-dropping uh, cost of renewable energy, the emergence of smart and more efficient grids, increasing policy action means there is a huge tide flowing. We're full of metaphors here this morning, but there's a huge tide flowing, and you can decide in which direction you want to swim, but the tide is not in your control, and the direction of that tide is very clear. And uh, what he said was, you will have big surprises in the next 12 months. These are his words. This is uh, Francesco Starace, the CEO of Enel. You will have big surprises in the next 12 months. You will have most companies, I presume he's referring to the utility, the utility sector, uh, moving in the same direction. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of lessons that other sectors can learn from the experience of the utility sector in the last 10 years. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Uh, I've got a sort of question for you. Um, the shareholders in the utility companies, they, they'd taken one story from, from the company boards who decided to stick with one strategy, and obviously they came off pretty poorly. Did they come back to the sell side analysts and the investment banks who were pushing out the research and say, hey, come on, how come you got this so wrong? Well, one thing I will say from my time as a, a, a working as a, in investor relations for one of the companies is that uh, we were getting questions from investors more than we were from sell-side analysts uh, in 2004, 2005 about the impact of, of renewables. And I would re only reiterate what Paul said. As a, as a sell-side analyst of 17 years, all my best reports and all my best ideas come from interactions with clients. So it, it's, the, it's the buy side that really needs to, to, to create the pressure as well. And it will. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is hand over to our last speaker, Helena, just to sort of get some insights and some reflections. I'd also like to hear as well from what sort of clients in Newton are asking you and how they're looking at the issue, and then we'll open up to questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, I suppose I'd like to uh, sort of throw down the gauntlet a bit. There's a lot of money in the room, both in asset owners and fund managers. Uh, we collectively sleptwalked into the financial crisis and we have no excuse for sleepwalking into a climate change crisis. Um, Christiana talked about a foghorn on a large ship. Uh, we've heard the incontrovertible evidence. Uh, there isn't the dispute or discussion really on the scientific aspect of climate change. Um, and yet still, throughout this morning, so far at least, I've heard a sense that, well, we don't have a roadmap and we need to wait for um, uh, Paris or we need to wait for uh, some guidance from regulators or we need to wait for a global carbon price. And, you know, to be honest, I think that um, we have only ourselves to blame if we don't do something to create, again, what Christiana was talking, a sense of urgency um, and more joined up, more leadership from the f investment community. Um, because as we've, I think, all agree here, uh, because we're probably, that's why we've come, um, we see this coming. And um, my um, uh, thought for, to really, I suppose, slightly step back from uh, some of the detail that we don't know, actually. I mean, I would suggest that there are many unknowns here, and there will be many unknowables, um, not just in the immediate future, but obviously uh, that problem gets worse as you look further out. Um, but we have uh, dealt with major changes, transformational changes, um, and we have to invest our clients' money, whatever the world uh, is doing around us. Um, and I would suggest that we can contribute a bit more to the unfolding of the developments. Um, some of the changes that we've already adapted to, obviously, has been some discussion about things like 
Eastman Kodak, um, and we also realize, I, I suppose, that more broadly, uh, we've had to adjust uh, for a more digital world. Business models uh, have consequently changed dramatically as a result. Um, the proportion of tangible assets versus intangibles um, for a company's valuation, all of that has changed, and we haven't, um, or perhaps if we have, we've missed out a bit, but we shouldn't be waiting um, to be told exactly how to value things. We should be engaged more. Um, and I think that um, there are things that we can do. Uh, there, there's been discussion, I think Anthony sort of threw down the gauntlet a bit about whether there's such a, um, a focus from investors on engagement as there is on divesting. Now, it can be that both scenarios are things that we should pursue. Certainly at Newton, we do offer the alternative for those uh, clients who make their own ethical decision that they do not want to invest in fossil fuel uh, companies. Um, certainly, uh, from the middle of December, our, our SRI fund for charities has a screen on fossil fuels, and that will exclude companies deriving more than 10% of turnover from the extraction of the most carbon-intensive fossil fuel resources, and that's been done in line with, um, really, the Church of England's uh, guidelines. So we can offer something for those clients who decide that they just do not want to invest at all. However, of course, this is a very major component of our lives, the energy sector. This is not um, like something like tobacco, where we can put a neat box around it and say we're going to exclude uh, investment in the companies that have exposure. Energy is obviously intrinsic to how we lead our daily lives, and even those companies directly associated with energy um, and resources account for about 30% of the FTSE index, and that's quite similar global um, situation for equity and fixed income assets. So I think it's very complex, and ideally what we want to do instead, I think, is to engage with companies and help them manage the risks. And that's not just through casual conversations. Uh, we've heard a bit about stress testing um, and actually demanding more about how companies themselves are adjusting for or aware of their own risks for a two-degree world. Um, but I think, again, that we can um, elevate the importance to which we uh, attach to these efforts um, and really develop a much more concerted and consistent campaign. I think it's no um, coincidence that both Saracen and Newton are represented on this panel because we would um, say very clearly that we do integrate um, this issue into our mainstream investment uh, processes. But I don't necessarily think that that's true throughout all organizations. I think that there is still, and perhaps we never all truly will until we don't have ESG um, sort of specialist areas, until that's all very firmly included in mainstream anal analysis and portfolio managers um, in their approach. But for now, I think we don't have integrated investing. We've made a lot about integrated reporting, but we don't really have integrated investing. The tendency, and here I'm talking about the industry as a whole, and perhaps wearing more of my investment association hat than my Newton hat, um, is that we uh, siphon off these particular specialist areas um, and, and work on that as a standalone um, area. And it's not really going to make much of a difference, to be honest, until we integrated into the mainstream um, assessment. So, I mean, I haven't offered solutions, and I think perhaps we can get on to discussing that, but we know the issues that are out there. We know um, that we have the uh, increased carbon prices. Uh, we know the um, issues around taxation of carbon. Um, we know the costs are involved with increasing research and investments into more renewable, um, clean energies. And we know that we need to um, make sure that companies are factoring climate change impact assessments into all of their own investments. And I think the investment community uh, can take away from today's event Let's not leave it just kind of standing as a sort of nice thing to go to um, in the guild hall and hear all the experts speak, but actually let's take it as a, as a call to action and come up with ways in which we can, um, I suppose, accelerate and take more responsibility ourselves. Okay, thank you very much, sir. And with, with your investment association hat on, um, so conferences like this tend to be rather sort of self-selecting. We follow their issues. We're obviously interested in climate and, and the financial angle. But with your investment association hat, um, you, without t speaking about individual members, but if you could read the sort of the mood music, the mood music of the membership, um, on a sort of, sort of scale of one to 10 of levels of interest, uh, insight and concern, um, how would you rank it? 
Well, I suppose I'd like to characterize that in saying that it just doesn't appear as a top 10 kind of issue. Um, okay, so we heard Paul's... At least in terms of... I should clarify that a bit, because that's going to be a headline somewhere, isn't it? Um, <laughs> damn, I've done it again. Um, that's the only way to get change, isn't it? Make a use controversial remarks, isn't it? Um, but actually, I think when we talk about issues for the industry, it does tend to be a little bit more introspective. And so I think then the, uh, the issues uh, tend to be around fee transparency, around how we... Um, represent the industry better in, um, in, the, in society, uh, educate people and so forth. So this issue as a kind of, you know, key um, one on the agenda just is not present. Okay, so the, the uh, ownership of the votes that re-elect boards of, say, fossil fuel companies, mm -hmm. they can either face a growth business as usual strategy or contract and runoff strategy. The votes are largely controlled by obviously asset owners and, and buy too. They also obviously listen to the investment managers mm. as to how to vote their shares. Do you think this is um, becoming a corporate governance challenge, given, given the huge downside risk that we heard from Paul? Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, again, and a slight clarification from a previous answer, individual fund managers back in their offices obviously are engaging on the issue. Um, in turn, again, we're trying to create a sort of joined up chain, I think, here. And I've seen the power of that over other movements that are unstoppable, like gender equality and so forth. That once everyone kind of gets on board with the idea and realizes this is the future, this is how to be modern, then you can create um, a completely different sort of mindset and urgency around the problem. But I think at the moment we're too say, siloed in terms of both individual firms engaging, uh, slightly blaming it on other parties in the chain. So, for example, saying, well, our clients, you know, are maybe looking to us for advice on this, but not instructing clearly. And that's why I think it's exciting that we have asset owners in the room as well today and that actually we can, you know, I say, uh, let's not pretend, we, we none of us have the answers. I mean, if we did, we could just sort of sort it all out and invest, you know, brilliantly for the next sort of 20 years, but, or 50 years or whatever it would be. But um, we are j on this journey together and it's much better if we can discuss and um, deal with these issues. I, I've learned in my life to deal with things sort of one step at a time and then it evolve as you do make progress. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, now, in about 10 minutes time, we're gonna have a coffee break, which will last 15 minutes. And what I'd like to do is get a wide range of questions from the floor. I think there's a mic going round. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those, those questions in, in groups of three. Uh, so I can see, well, I can see, I've, I've seen three. Um, if the mic can go first to, to Raj. And then there's two behind you, so I'll, I'll take you next. Um, and if you can introduce who you are, that would be helpful. Um, Raj Samos from Preventable Surprises. Helena, thank you uh, for your typically direct and, and straight speaking. Um, and, and that's something we all know is the reality, so you're not saying anything that's not new. My question, and I also liked what you said about small steps, um, and linking that to the previous panel about the lack of disclosure. We've had huge success from the Aiming for A work in terms of getting disclosure from a few uh, oil and gas companies, and now increasingly perhaps um, mining companies. What we haven't had is industrial scale disclosure of those sectors. And that's something that those small collaboratives can't do, but something that the investment association could mandate. And I just wondered, again, I'm not asking for a commitment, but I'm just wondering whether that's the kind of small step that the big players could do to, to trigger the change in risk management. Thank you very much. And then there's two questions behind, behind you. One, yes. Hi, Eleanor Besley Gould from 1010. Um, we've had a mix of views in terms of influences on the market trajectory, um, and Christina pointed to the importance of political will, and I just wondered if the, the panel has any thoughts on the role of political leadership in the current situation in Britain, um, largely in the small ter uh, short term, but also longer term, and whether investors are getting nervous. Uh, Catherine Bryan from Synchronicity Earth. Um, one of the key barriers, it seems, in the asset management community is indexation. Um, because much, uh, so many asset managers are benchmarked against an index in which there's a very high weighting of fossil fuel utility companies. Unless more managers are prepared to move away from that framework, that is a major barrier to change. 
Okay, thanks for that. Now we're going to have short, quick, pithy answers. And if you don't feel the, the want or need to answer a question, don't. For those that do, we've got three questions. One was on disclosure. We need an industrial and level types of disclosure. What's the role of the investment association? Then we had a question about political leadership. And then lastly, one of, um, of indexation. So if we start at that end, Okay, well, I might um, just quickly answer one and three. Um, so on the first, um, yes, I think it's a good um, challenge to me to go back to the Investment Association. I think that's the purpose as well of events like today, that you can see the strength of, um, I suppose, the growing crescendo of noise around the issue. I do think you need both. I think I'd like to stress, I mean, Newton's had some, I don't think we can claim complete credit for it, but, you know, when we've discussed things like Shell and its Arctic plans and then them abandoning those, it wasn't all down to us, but I'm sure that other individual investment groups discussed that type of thing and then that, that had an impact. So I think we need to do both, and I think the top-down and the bottom-up are very mutually um, reinforcing, if we can get that. I think on the last point, I would like to say in a case for the defense for, uh, obviously Newton does not manage any benchmark money, um, but I would ha highlight a company like Elgin that has um, a very active, engaged group of um, uh, specialists who work on the basis that their job is to try to increase the value of all of the companies that they have to invest in because they are benchmark investors. They own 4% of the FTSE and the 250. And I believe that they are alongside act, good active investors in terms of taking, um, uh, engaging one by one with companies on the things they can do to prepare to smooth the transition to replace fossil fuel exposure with more renewable sources. Thank you. Um, in terms of the indexed funds, I think as a, if, if I were an index manager, which thankfully I'm not, I, I would want obviously to maximize the performance of my portfolio uh, on a balanced basis. Um, what I think that means for the oil industry is looking at the return metrics that they're coming up with. And uh, I, those of you who paid very careful attention to Natasha's slide might have seen that the return on capital for the oil industry started going down two or three years before the oil price. So it, the oil industry has not underperformed the market over the past five years because of the oil price. There's an element of that. It's because of what they invested in. Um, they invested in low return assets. What I would be going, what I would be banging on their doors and screaming about is, you have blown billions and billions of dollars on assets that would have earned a marginal return over capital, even at $120 or Brent. And I'm afraid, down at 50, a lot of the investment decisions that were taken two, three years ago are going to be destroying shareholder value. So I, I think that. You know, divestment fine, but I, I still feel even the index funds have, have a role to go in there and, and bang on doors, as you said, like uh, legal in general. Thanks, Paul. Mark? Um, well, I, I don't want to talk about the politics per se uh, in the UK at the moment, um, but what I, what I think is illustrative about the situation of the UK power market, where we find ourselves in this energy transition, is the fact that it is now becoming very difficult to see how almost any kind of of uh, new power generating capacity gets built without some form of, of government assistance. We've obviously had the, the Hinkley Point uh, nuclear power plant in the news a lot in the last uh, week or so. Uh, I, d I don't think anybody uh, thinks that could have been built without a very strong government guarantee uh, around the price. Uh, for the next 35 years. Uh, we're still at the stage, I think, where, where renewables do need some support, although I think the price there is clearly uh, coming down further. But to build coal and, and, and gas-fired plants, we've had some gas, new planned gas-fired capacity pulled uh, from the market because the capacity payments were not, um, uh, were, were not sufficient. So I, I think uh, what we're finding ourselves in is exactly what I was talking about earlier, a situation where despite very clear uh, policy framework, at least until recently, uh, despite very clear policy framework in Europe, we've reached a point now where the transition has, has everybody uh, knowing what the final outcome is and it's how you get there. And I think there is still a role, clearly, for uh, government, uh, stronger government guidance on some of these areas as we get through, because uh, this sector is further advanced than any other. And um, I, I think but that doesn't mean we, we, we uh, do not need uh, strong signals. We still do. Okay, thanks. Natalia? Very um, quick comment in response to Raj's point about disclosure. There is nothing more important in my mind than having accurate numbers that are being disclosed by the companies and therefore used by investors to make their decisions on how they allocate capital. So those numbers need to be accurate. We already have a system in place within our existing company law framework 
that requires companies are providing a true and fair view of the uh, underlying economic situation of that business. And I think there's already, therefore, scope for that kind of industrial scale disclosure. I think Mark Carney made a big point about greater disclosure. Um, and I think the newly introduced viability statement now companies have to make uh, looking forward and uh, making some very serious commentary on their kind of um, planning horizon time frame about future solvency will pose quite serious uh, issues for the oil and gas industry in terms of setting out that long-term viability when they're facing that kind of an existential threat. So I think the system's are already in place. It's just about making them work. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and sneak in another just couple of questions. I know we're kind of almost out of ta time. I saw two hands here and there was one at the back. So we're going to do three very quick ones and then I want um, the responses also to be your concluding remarks, if that's possible. Okay, so the, do we have uh, the, mi the mics? Here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Jacob Tomei from the Two Degrees Investing Initiative. Um, first, thanks, Mark, for perhaps highlighting the extent to sometimes we, the people in this room, are introspective as well around the issue of climate change and the potential financial implications. I think we also need to continue to stress test the visions that are, we've discussed here on the podium and maybe alternative views to them. My question is regarding the implications. So I'd, I'd like to connect the dots between the question on indexing. Organizations worked a lot on that and the valuation of companies. Um, because the logic, of course, is that if the company is overvalued, then why would you own it in the first place? And there's kind of this issue that on the one hand, you want to keep broad diversification. Okay, we've got to better be quick. So, right. so on, so on overvaluation, valuation. so the next one is at the front, and then we've got one, the last one here. So if we take this gentleman first. David Martin <coughs> from the United Reform Church. There's been some encouragement uh, with the European oil companies uh, forming an initiative but the US-based ones like Chevron and Exxon seem not to be getting the message at all. Uh, the question is, is there any chance that they will get the message? And uh, if so, uh, what do we need to do to help them get the message? Got it, okay, thanks. And then the last one is at, just at the front. Jessica Shankleman from Business Green. Helena, you mentioned walking into this climate crisis. I wanted to ask about the Volkswagen scandal. Um, we knew for years before this came out that there was a gap between real world emissions and those tested. Um, what impact has that had on investors in terms of waking up to the realities of environmental risks? Good, okay, so we had three questions there. One on, on valuation and implications. One was on um, how do we get the US-based companies uh, waking up and, uh, and then the point about, um, about Volkswagen. We, we, we probably guessed even then that something was happening on the emissions testing. Why didn't we pick it up? So we're also gonna look for some concluding comments um, around on this panel. Thank you. If we start at that end again with Helena, if you'd like to go oh, first. Oh, sorry. Um, some very quick ones, please. Some quick ones. So, I mean, f just quickly on valuations, for us as, again, as an active investor, we can actually choose to sort of underweight a whole sector. So I'm afraid we less sort of, you know, we're, we're going to be making a decision based on where we see best value from one sector to another. What, so I, I'm not going to comment really further on that, really. Um, on the Volkswagen, I guess one of my questions back to you, if you can shout it, is did you tell anybody? Yeah, so that's, that's, we need to improve the conduits, don't we? We need to improve, how does it get, I um, mean, I've often discussed Newton having been the largest shareholder in Northern Rock in 2002 and sold out completely by 2005. And although we weren't predicting the company's sort of ultimate collapse, some of the reasons why we divested were very much sort of what happened, um, only more in extremists than we did in investment. That we need to have a better way of communicating these concerns, I think. Thank you. Paul? Um, I'll take carbon pricing. Um, I think the reason the Europeans are so ready to sign up that it doesn't actually really matter for them. Um, I'm surprised the Americans didn't as well. If you actually apply a carbon price of roughly $40 to the emissions that come directly from oil companies, it probably works out at around $4 a barrel, which in the context of a fifth, well, what was a $100 oil price, isn't that material. What is material is taxing the entire barrel, the combustion of that barrel. Uh, in the UK, we currently, this, the maths would probably be slightly wrong, I reckon the carbon price that you have on the gasoline you bought last week is probably near a $400 a tonne. Um, the problem is, obviously, in the United States, where uh, they're paying, I think it's roughly still $2 a gallon, where I think my mental maths put it at over 10 at the present. That's the problem. Thanks. Well, 
Well, I, I would just follow on from what Paul said. I mean, I think the experience of the last uh, 10 years in the utility sector is such that if we'd had a, if we'd had a stronger carbon price, the transition would have been uh, driven more quickly. I would like to think, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt, that, that part of the reason that the oil and gas sector now, at least in Europe, is pushing for carbon pricing is that they want to avoid some of the problems that have been caused in Europe by mispricing because of low carbon prices. So I think that's the optimistic interpretation. We have to see how that develops. That dialogue has really only uh, just begun. Great. Okay, I'll pick up the question on the US oil and gas companies. When will they actually listen? I think very simply when the oil price, gas prices come down and they have to um, impair assets. Okay, thank you very much for that panel. Um, I'm still wondering and puzzling over that. How, how come the companies are still saying that demand for fossil fuels is going to grow by 30% in coming years when the INDCs say we have to reduce emissions by 30%? I still see this as the, the main question that cannot be reconciled. Some of the answer is in this fantastic new publication from the Carbon Tracker Initiative called Lost in Transition. We should all be on your seats. Do pick it up and we'd like to hear from you your thoughts. Thank you very much. Oh yes, we're gonna take a coffee break for about 15 minutes. Thank you.